All right, and these are going to work independently and interact with each other through APIs. We got there. That was, that was frustrating, but we got there. Uh, so first, I want to talk about APIs quick. We've seen these before. In CSE 115, you saw web APIs, and we mostly connected to them. You had an API sitting there on the, the internet, and you would write code to connect to that API. And the API would have certain endpoints that you would connect to, and you would be able to access those through GET and POST requests, and then get the information that you want back from them and interact with the API through those endpoints. You also saw, by the end, you were writing your own API that would access some data and then send that data back and you would write the front end to access your own API to get that data and display it uh, on a map or in a graph or, uh, or whatever you ended up doing for your project. So in general, so those were APIs as you've seen them already. In general, and I've used this term in this class, we've used them in this class as well. In general, an API is a set of functions or methods that can be called or a set of uh, a list of ways that you can interact with something. So it's an application programming interface. I don't think I put the full, uh, full expansion of the acronym out there, but application programming interface, the, it's a way for our software to interact, to interface with other pieces of code. So, we, uh, <coughs> so we have a list of ways to interact with it, usually a list of functions or methods, that we'll call to interact with an object. So, for example, our physics engine, we had a pretty simple API. We had update world. That was our whole API. That's our entry point into the world of physics. That update world method has to be there, it has to exist. That's why that was the primary objective. That's how we're going to interact with our physics engine anytime we use it. We're just going to call update world. We're going to give it a, a world with all the objects, static and dynamic objects in it, and physics takes over from there. So we don't have to think about how the physics engine is implemented ever again. We just access it through that API. Now, if we want to add new behavior to our physics, we want to add, for example, dynamic collisions. If you did the, the bonus, or rather, if you didn't do the bonus, but you want to add that later, you want dynamic objects to bounce off each other, you can add that to the physics engine and just don't touch the API at all. Don't change the update world header. Don't change the way that's called. Just still have it be called update world and take in a world uh, and delta time. I knew there was a second there. And delta time. Have it take those two parameters and return unit. As long as that part doesn't change, you're going to be good with that. It's going to, you're going to be able to update how your physics engine behaves not touch the API, not change the API at all, and now every game that uses that physics engine has dynamic collisions. You just gain that extra functionality without changing your game at all, but we did change the physics engine. Now, if we change the API itself, say we have an API method that takes a double and then we change it to an int, for example, if delta time, instead of taking a double, maybe we want to use the epic time that we saw last lecture, Maybe we want to change that to a long and take the epic time state. Well, if we change that, we just broke every piece of software that uses our physics engine. Every piece of software that we wrote that uses that physics engine is now broken, and we have to go and change a lot of code if we use that in a lot of places to be able to update that. So if you have, say, a physics engine, you host it on GitHub, and a million different people are using it, and you decide to change the API, you just made a lot of people real mad because you just broke their code on that latest update. So you don't want, to, don't want to change the API ever, but you can add new functionality using the same API. As long as the API doesn't change. You can add functionality to it, but don't change how the methods are called. Question? Isn't that why they give uh, deprecation warnings sometimes? Yes, so, so you get deprecation warnings if a part of an API is going to be removed or not supported or not updated you'll start getting the deprecation warnings, like, hey, stop using this because we're, we want to remove this from the API, but they're not just going to remove it outright because it's going to break a lot of old code. So they give the deprecation warnings, they give everyone a heads up, and then if they ever do finally remove it, they'll, uh, uh, it, it'll still break some software. But usually, API endpoints are never removed, they're just deprecated, so they still exist, they still work, so they don't break the old code but they'll be deprecated to let people know like, hey, you really shouldn't be using this 
Uh, but we're going to leave it there just because we don't want to break old code. We want that backwards compatibility with the old software. We still want that stuff to work. But if you're writing new software, don't use this. That's what the deprecation warning means. Don't use it anymore. But it's part of the API that they don't really want there, but they can't break the old stuff. Oh, that's... So I split this into two slides, but I forgot to remove the bottom half of this one. That's why that's so much text. Uh, anyway. So what is MVC? So that, that was just a, a side note on APIs. I've been using that term a lot. I wanted to make sure I defined it a little bit better than I had before. Uh, so MVC, we're breaking our programs into three parts. The model, view, and controller. The model is going to control all of the, really the core of our program. What our program does is in the core. How it handles its data, how it handles its state, really everything that it does is in the model. This is most of the code that you've written so far in 115, 116. A lot of what we've done was work on the model. The physics engine, that is purely model code that would not touch the viewer front, or view or control. The view is responsible just for visualizing things to the user. So the view will get the state of the program from the model and show it to the user, display it to the user. This is all of our output, the output behavior of our GUI. This is what the view is. It's just displaying, displaying the current state of the program to the user. And it doesn't do anything. The view does not compute anything. It's strictly just taking the state from the model and showing it to the user. And finally, the controller is going to handle any interaction that the user wants to do, anything the user does in this app. It's going to capture the user inputs and tell those inputs to the model. So it's concerned with user input is uh, the controller. So we can think of view as user output, control as user input, and the model is everything in between those two, everything that doesn't interact with the user. And the control is going to call the model API methods to be able to modify the model. So we have our user. Our user is going to interact with the controller. That's our keyboard, our mouse, our touch screens. Any way that we can interact with the program, that's the controller. The controller is going to take those raw inputs and figure out what to do with them and convert them into API calls of the model. It's going to call those API methods of the model from those user inputs based on what it wants to do with those user inputs. The model is going to update all of its state. It's going to do all the core logic of our program that it needs to do based on those user inputs. It's going to update that state. Then the view is going to access that state. This could either be the model pushing the new update to the view or the view grabbing the, the new state from the model. But in some way, the view is going to have to get that current state of the program from the model and then show that to the user. So this is our, our typical loop that we're going to see with MVC. The user has some inputs. Those inputs go to the model. The model updates the state. And then the change is shown to the user. So the user is only accessing the control and viewing the view. It doesn't, the user does not have to be aware of any of this part of the program. And on the same token, the model does not have to be aware of the user either. So we're going to take advantage of this a bit. When we're coding a model, we are not thinking about the user at all. And the user is not thinking about the model at all. These two pieces are, are at opposite ends of our software. They, don't in, they never interact with each other directly. And we'll talk about why we want that as well. So like I said, most of what you've written so far is part of the model. The calculator, you're doing a little bit of controller work, but mostly just the parts that interact with the model. You're building these models to be able to, um, to, be able to simulate software. You did the last semester, you did, for example, the uh, computing trades, uh, taking a, a list of trades and computing, OK, how much of each stock do I own at the end of this? Where are, where are all the trades valid and stuff? That's all model stuff. But you never said, OK, how do I make, place a trade? How does the user place a trade? How do I display this information to the user? We never worried about that. Most of them worried about model, uh, model stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll talk plenty. We've talked plenty about model over the 
QCW. The view output only, we're just showing the state of the model to the user, the current state of the software to the user. This also does not control any button action, for example, that's part of the controller. The view might display a button to the user, but once it gets down to what does this button do, the view does not care about that at all. The view is strictly there to display information to the user, display the current state of the program, to show them what's going on here. So the view doesn't do anything, but the nice part about the view in setting this up as an MVC architecture are these last three bullet points. These are kind of the three that we're really getting at here, is the view doesn't care about the controller or the, maybe that's a little too strong, but the view can be swapped out at any time while we're developing or especially while we're testing. If we want to test an app that uses an MVC architecture, like for example, the calculator uses MVC architecture, when we want to test that, we don't have to touch the view at all. The view is just there for the user's benefit, not really for the programmer's benefit. So we can completely ignore the view while we're testing the calculator and just work through the controller, which is going to access the model. We can do that when these are decoupled, as opposed to if we had one big file with model view and controller all just intermixed, we're going to have to use that GUI in that view to be able to test the model. And this is something that we definitely want to avoid. We want those to be decoupled, we want the view to be decoupled from the controller and the model. And this is what we're doing with this architecture, is decoupling our code and getting each piece of code to just be worried about one thing. This is really what we want. Our view, that GUI, or that, not the whole GUI, but the view part of the GUI is only concerned with showing stuff to the user. So we can interact with our model and test our model completely separately. It, when we wrote Physics Engine, we didn't care about a GUI, we didn't care about a game, none of that, but we're still able to test all that functionality because it was decoupled. And now we can use that tested solid code with the Physics Engine, we can use that in Jumper, even though Jumper had no idea what the Physics Engine was, the Physics Engine had no idea what Jumper is, but we can test each separately, we can slap the, uh, physics engine in there, and as long as Jumper is creating a world with static and dynamic objects and calling update world, there's no problems. We can have that loose coupling between these pieces of code and build one large program with these smaller components that can be built and tested independently and interact with each other through APIs. So that's what we're getting at. So whether our view is, say, a command line interface, a GUI interface, a web interface, it doesn't matter to our model. Our model does not care. So we can have multiple views and different views and swap out our views without affecting our core program. And that's the behavior that we want. And the controller is going to convert those user inputs into calls of the model's API. In ScalaFX, this is mostly through event handlers. The event handlers are the controllers in that app. So in the, in the view, we'll create a button, but as the controller, the controller is going to have that on click. What happens when this button is clicked? That's where we just say, well, we'll just tell the controller about it and the controller will do whatever it does. So those event handlers in ScalaFX, that's our controller. Whatever's converting user inputs into something that our app is going to, going to handle. That's what, what this controller is. So why set this up like this? There's quite a few advantages, and unlike the state pattern, there's really not much disadvantage. I guess you could say if you have a really tiny app that this might add a little complexity. Even then, I don't know, MVC has uh, pretty strong advantages. Excuse me. For very large apps, there are some disadvantages, but to the point where, where teams will do something more advanced than MVC. They'll have a, a different architecture that can handle more cases. Uh, they'll, they'll never go to, no, let's just throw everything in one file. But there are different architectures once a program gets way too big that, are, that add more complexity than MVC to, uh, uh, to handle those larger projects. But really, MVC 
versus nothing. It's really not much disadvantage, but let's talk about the advantages. You focus on one piece of the project at a time. If you're working on the view, you're not thinking about how the app works. You just get data and display. That's all you're concerned about. What's the current state of the model? Let's show that to the user. If you can code that, you got your view, and it's going to work with the other two pieces. When I'm building my model, let's just make this work. Let's just define the API and make sure that we get the right behavior on each method call. And now I can write tests and say, okay, what if somebody calls this method, this method, then this method, what should the state of the model be? And I can test that pretty easy, easily with some asserts. If I'm working on the controller, okay, the user hits this button, how do I convert that into an, uh, an API call of the model or maybe a few calls? How do I convert that into calls of the API? How do I adapt raw user inputs into the uh, the API. For example, if somebody hits the up arrow button, I don't want to tell the model, hey, somebody hit the up arrow button. I want to say player one hit the up button and tell, uh, tell the model that as an endpoint. And if you're splitting up the work, agree on those APIs. Hey, I'm writing the model. Here's the API I'm going to implement. Now somebody writing the controller knows which methods that they have to call and you can both work independently. Just agree on the API. How are our two pieces of code going to interact? And that's it. Here's the data that I'm going to have in the model. You tell that to the person working on the view. As long as you agree on how the data is going to be represented, it's no big deal. They can just uh, take that data and render it. Uh, and all, as always, easier to add new features. So. And this is what we really want to get at in this course. I say it's easy to add new features a lot in this course because really that's what we're doing. When our software gets large, how do we keep it all organized and easy to maintain? If we're building a web app like you did in 115, like we, we will, uh, we'll dabble in a little in 116 here. If we're building a web app, the server, all that server side code, that's your model. <coughs> The front end code, your JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, that's your mostly view. And then the controller is a little bit split, the line gets a little blurred here in, uh, on the web. But part of your controller is that JavaScript making those Ajax calls, or as you'll see, WebSockets uh, interactions. And partly on the server, on the server you can validate those inputs and finally convert those, uh, those messages in those Ajax calls and those WebSocket messages. You can convert those into the final API calls of your model. The nice thing about this, I'll talk about it in a few slides here, but, but I want to mention this earlier rather than later. The nice thing about this is your model doesn't even know it's a web. We can have our physics engine, or we can have the model of your calculator, or we can have the model of the jumper project sitting on a server running and have any of those three be used as a web app. As long as we write a front end for it and then have the network communication finally get converted into model API. Nothing about those models even says whether it's a desktop app, a web app, whether the user is using a keyboard or a mouse, doesn't know any of that. It just defines its API of how it's going to be interacted with. And we can use those models and reuse those models for a lot of different types of software. We never want to throw away code. We want to be able to reuse code as often as possible. And we can always reuse these models because they're completely unaware of that user or how they're interacting. They just define an API and that's it. Implement that API, and then whoever calls it, it's whatever. So let's look at a few examples that we've seen already. In Jumper, the model API, we had six input methods called by the controller. That's up, left, right, or jump, left, right, if you want to say, uh, look at them that way, for each player. So three buttons and each player, each of the two players, and it's hard-coded as a two-player game, each player gets three buttons that they can press. And then one, 
Well, I, it, it wasn't exactly one method, but allowing the view to access all of the data of that. The controller, that's where we define, okay, what buttons on an actual physical keyboard are going to be the left, right, and jump buttons for each player. And we said WAD, left, up, right. These are going to be our inputs for each player. And then the view will access the game, access all of the state of the game, and then render that and display it to the user, and also figure out how to scroll, uh, how to scroll up and down. So if we look at the jumper code, we have the view, and I've been, uh, even though we haven't been talking about MVC yet, you've seen that I've been splitting these into a model view and controller package. In the view package, we have just the GUI, one file, and it's going to set up all the game. It's going to say, okay, players, I'm going to represent them as squares, platforms are going to be squares. Uh, I'm going to define what color each player is. I'm going to define what color the platforms are. Uh, if I wanted to add some more textures, I would do that here. Anything related just to how the game looks to the user, that's going to be in the view. I have this, this method convert Y, so I'm going to take an absolute Y from the game. So the game has one axis system where all of the platforms have an absolute position according to the axis system, but the view has to scroll up as the players climb. So I'm going to take in an absolute Y and the height of <coughs> and the height of that object and translate it up. I have the, the line on the bottom, the game is keeping track of that so it knows when a player dies. I'm going to reuse that value to translate everything up, or rather down, based on that scroll height. So whatever my scroll height is, I want to translate that, and that's the view's job. The game itself, it's concerned where that kill line is so it knows when to put a player in the game over state, but the game itself does not care about the scrolling at all. For all it knows, the player could be viewing the entire game, uh, the entire vertical piece, uh, part of the game, all in one screen. It just doesn't care, it doesn't know about that. But the view is responsible for that scrolling. How to display sprites, displaying all of the, the game elements. I'm going to have this update method which is going to just take in the state of the game. And here, just because there were a lot of variables, we could split this up. But accessing the game directly, getting the positions of the players and the positions of every single platform and every, uh, in both of the walls, and renders them all on the screen. Now I put this in the update timer, so it's just going to access the game 60 times a second, say, hey game, where is everything now? Hey game, where is everything now? Hey game, where is everything now? And it's just going to keep pulling that data from the game and rendering it 60 times a second. So the game doesn't even have to know that this is happening. The game's just doing its own thing on its, uh, on its own. Well, actually being called right here, the update method. But the game is doing its own thing, not caring that its state is even being accessed. It's just updating whatever it needs to update. And then add that to the timer. In the controller, here's where we access the, uh, the API methods. We just have, for each player, oh, I guess, we, yeah, we do have times two states, whether a button was pressed or released. So I just want to know everything about each one of those presses of those six keys that I'm concerned with. And then I can have it be the WASD controls or the left, right, up controls. So if we're using arrows or WASD, even though down and, and uh, S doesn't do anything in this game, we want to be able to change that. So the controller is taking those raw inputs. I got a key press of a certain value. I'm going to look up that key code, check out what it was, and then a default do nothing if it wasn't one of the keys I care about. If it was one of the keys I care about, call that model and call one of these methods. Then in the model, we have all the key presses 
which in this case we deferred to the state for the actual behavior, but we have all the key presses and those, that's what's going to update the state of our game. And it's only through the player, the game itself doesn't really have an API, it's just going to have its state accessed by the view, uh, but the game is changing based on player action. Whenever a player has an action, the game is going to update. And then we can watch all those updates uh, through the view. So we've decoupled our code into viewing the player uh, code that displays the state of the game to the user, code that takes the raw user inputs and interacts with the model, and then the model which takes in API calls and updates its state for the view to display. For calculator, the model API is mostly up to you. The only one method is defined for you, that's display number, which returns a double. So that part of the API you have to have because that's the one that's going to be accessed by the view. It's the only one that's going to be accessed by the view. This is how the view knows what to display. The state of the model really is what number is being displayed. There's other state, but not the other state that you create doesn't have to be viewed by the user. The user doesn't really care, or, or uh, I shouldn't say care, but they, they don't have to visualize all the other state variables and everything else that that, store, that calculator model is controlling. But the display number, that one we need, so we know what to display on the calculator. It's only one output on a calculator. It's the number that's being displayed. The controller is half implemented for you. You have all the the event listeners, the event handlers, defined for you, but the methods are empty. Their handle methods don't do anything right now, and that's because uh, I don't know what your API for your model is going to look like, so I can't put anything there. So however you define your model for your API, for your API for your model, update your controller to call those methods when the appropriate buttons are pressed. And finally, the view, it's going to access that display number and display that to the GUI. Other than that, it's displaying the buttons. Those buttons don't change. You just throw them on there once, but the display number, that's being updated each time the user makes an action. And a few things, if you've looked at this code, you've seen this, but I'm using, uh, so on Monday we used a vertical box to stack elements. We could use a horizontal box if we want all the elements horizontally. But here I'm using a grid pane to get a 2D grid and be able to place elements with a bit more control and placing them exactly where I want them to be placed. So with the grid pane, I'm going to give the, the uh, indices, the location for each of these elements and get them placed exactly where I want. So I can get those buttons right where I want them to be. And I have a button, calculator button class. This is just to reduce a lot of code clutter and also make it easy to change the size of the calculator. If I want the calculator to be bigger or smaller, or if you want your calculator to be bigger or smaller, you just change these buttons. If I change this 85 to 50, I'll scale down all the buttons. And I'll have a smaller calculator. Uh, and I also have some code to, like the equals, oh, <laughs> jazz right there, because it's, uh, I, well, I know why that happened, but I'll explain it since I showed that. Uh, since this is min width and mid height, like I said last time, the, if the text is larger than that, it, you know, it, it'll do what you saw there. It'll expand the size of the button to the size of the text. So I got some jank there, but oh well. Uh, so just some things, some polymorphism, or uh, polymorphism here to uh, get, a, get a little easier functionality to be able to create all these buttons, because we got a lot of buttons, I didn't want to cut and paste a lot of code. And actions, I'll give a little bit of spoiler here. <clears throat> these actions are going to convert each of these button presses into calls of your calculator API. My calculator API, you're welcome to do the same thing. I just use each button press as an API method. So in my calculator, I have a clear press method, for example. So when the clear button is pressed, it's going to call calculator.clearPressed. 
and then have my calculator handle it from there. So I'm really not doing anything fancy in my controller. I'm just calling the, the appropriate, uh, calling the corresponding, <coughs> calling the corresponding uh, API methods that are just the same thing. Clear was pressed, I just want to know in my calculator model what button was pressed. The button presses really correlate directly with a logical API model in this case, so I just, uh, uh, so I just call the, those methods, I just write methods for those button presses. Can't imagine a calculator that's not going to have those kinds of button presses. But in the model, nothing in your model knows about that GUI or really the controller. So if we did want to move this to a web app, you want to write a JavaScript, an HTML GUI for your calculator, and then send those button presses over a network, your model doesn't change at all. You just grab those button presses, simulate those button presses in your model, and it does the same exact thing. The same functionality works if it's a web app, a desktop app. If you don't want to use ScalaFX, you want to write a new GUI, you update the view and the controller, the model stays the same. This is the advantage of the model not being aware of the user, is it always stays the same and we can reuse that code. Well, I just said that. <coughs> so if we want to swap out ScalaFX for a new library, rewrite the view and controller, your model stays the same, you just have your new controller access the same API endpoints, the same methods. <coughs> And the view, you can always change. You can change the view, change the size of those buttons there. I didn't have to update my controller model at all, for example. If I want to rearrange the buttons, nothing else changes, just the view, things like that. Let's talk about your project for a little bit. We, uh, demo two is out there. If you look at lab activity four, the, doc, the bottom of the doc has, has demo two out there. Yeah, in the same way that lab activity one had demo one bottom of it. I want you to be aware of it so you know what you're working on for the next two weeks of the, the project. So Lab Activities 2, Lab Activity 4 this week, and Demo 1 were all about your controller, and we, or not your controller, the model, and you'll do a bit more model work as we keep going through the semester. Activity uh, Demo 3 will have a lot more model work, for example. So we're building the model, the logic of our game. When you had, okay, a character gets hit. How does a character get hit? How does it, you know, I don't care. When it gets hit, this is what's going to happen. When it gains experience, this is what's going to happen. That's all model stuff, and those are going to be used and accessed through our model API, which we haven't fully defined yet. As we build out the project, we're going to build a controller that's going to call those model API methods, and which we'll end up calling our take damage and, and our other methods, and we'll use that code later, but we haven't accessed that model yet. For demo two, it's all about your view and a little bit of your controller, but not much since we don't have the model API methods implemented yet. It's really not much we can call there. We could have stubbed out methods, but, uh, but we'll save that for demo three. So mostly the view, either you're doing the, the overworld or the battle view, and you're going to get a big JSON string with a lot of information in it, and you have to render that to the screen somehow. So we're not worried about where that JSON string is coming from at the moment. It will come from the model. It'll come over the network at some point. We're just concerned about how to render all of the information contained in that JSON string. That's what you're worried about for demo two, for the view, and then a little bit of controller if you're doing the overworld, capturing the user inputs, and we will end up just sending those to the model like we're doing in the, the other examples. Uh, for demo two specifically, you do have to simulate a little bit here. You do have to simulate the character moving so we can test your screen scrolling. The screen has to scroll when you hit the, the edges. So you have to simulate a little bit just for demo two, and then in the, the long run, those inputs will be sent to the model, and then you'll access the new state uh, through the view. And if you're in battle, the user has to have a way to choose what action they're going to take and what target they're going to take that action on. You have to send those inputs to the model, and that one we're just purely simulating. You just print them to the screen for this one. Demo three is going to be a lot more controller and model. It's specifically the networking. So, so I, don't, I don't think I've been very open about what the, the whole vision of this project is this semester. So let me, I want to talk about that a little bit. 
In demo three specifically, or phase three, we're going to be building some more of the networking, building the networking part of this code, and then the desktop GUI and the web GUI are going to communicate over the network to your server. Your server is going to run the model for, for the game, and both of these front ends are going to communicate over the network to that model. So we're going to have one model running on a server, and then users using the web version or the desktop version are going to be able to interact with each other. So no matter what version they're using, they'll be able to interact with each other, play against each other, and so forth. So it doesn't matter what the platform is, they can still interact with each other. We see this with things like Netflix. Netflix has one model running on a server, running all of its core logic, and then they have just different views and controllers running on pretty much every platform imaginable these days. They're not rewriting all of their business logic and everything for each one of those apps. They just have a different video player, different menus, and then they're sending those user inputs to their server using the same API endpoints as all of the other apps. So it's not too much work for them to build another app for another platform because they're reusing all of their server code. They just need a new view and controller. That's all they need for, for another one. <clears throat> so for this one, we'll have two different views, two different controllers, but one model serving both, both of them. And we're able to do this because we have this MVC architecture where the model is completely separate from the view and controller. The model is just sitting there with some API methods that can be called on it, and it doesn't care who's calling those methods or who's accessing the current state. Well, that brings us back to the lecture question. The lecture question split up into model view controller, of course, where we have the view, which you don't have to edit. The view is already done. It's a chat app with one box, a send button, and then the chat history. One view. The controller is when you push the button, what does it do? And the model we're going to access as two API calls, either sending a message or getting the entire chat. Sending a message will be accessed by the controller. Getting the chat is accessed by the view. But once we have it set up like this, what if we also want our users to be able to hit the enter button to send a message? And this is where we get, of course, the able to expand our code, add new features fairly easily. If we have this all in one big file, one big uh, mess of a program, this might be difficult to have people hit enter, I mean, depending on how it's organized and, and whatnot. Maybe it's organized well as one file. But with this setup, we're going to add one more event listener. We could add one more event listener that listens for key presses. And then if that key press is enter, call the model endpoint, call that model API endpoint, then say, hey, I got a new message. Same thing as clicking that button. We just add one more piece to our controller. And we can add that functionality. We can expand that pretty easily. We can wrap our heads around that pretty easily without chasing down a lot of code. And we're back to this. Right, any questions? All right. So see everyone Friday. Good luck finishing up the calculator if you haven't. See you for the quiz on Friday.